You're listening to The Valley Current. Professor Chodos, meet Professor Acker. I wanted you guys to come on not only to meet each other, but to come into the Valley Current and help me with part three, which is this beautiful 10 page decision by Royce Lambert. I have to say, I thought he was going to write 50 pages and he wrote 10. And I just bow to him because there's nothing like writing an under 10 page decision. And that says it all, literally, that says it all in under 10 pages. I have to give him and his clerk or clerks a lot of credit. They turned it around very quickly. The hearing was yesterday. We were sort of following it on the Valley Current special edition podcast with with Dr. Uh, with, with Professor Chodos. And Bob was one of the first people to comment in response to my email about what's going on. In fact, he had already written a lengthy comment. And I thought, Bob, you should come on. And then we should have Raphael talk about what's the next step for the well, government. I mean, literally, he gives a little bit to each side, and he signals. I, I'm a little, I'm a little loath, you know, to comment in front of people who know what they're talking about because I retired decades ago. But even from my more or less, you know, amateur point of view, it struck me as the most preposterous presentation I'd, I'd ever seen. They, the government was asked, what remedy do you propose? And the remedy they proposed was, well, Bolton made the mess, so he has to come up with a remedy. In other words, we pass. The judge asked, what remedy do you propose? And they passed. Why even bother to go to court? Not, like, did they, 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 and then maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that if the bookstores and the publisher are not parties, then they're not subject to the jurisdiction of the court. But let's give Raphael a chance to comment on your comment and then We'll go around in a circle, well, kind of counterclockwise. Well, yeah, on the their pleading includes a prayer for relief. Uh, when I was reading it, I thought to myself, you can't have this relief. But they have a clear answer to the question. This is the relief they want. And the judge quotes them in his opinion. He actually picks up what they put in the, in the complaint and repeats it here. I'm looking well, for well, repeats Well, it, repeats it with kind of a jaundiced view of, you've got to be kidding. And right. literally one... You know, this is on page three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Mandatory injunctions require Bolton to, quote, ensure that his publisher and resellers receive notice of this injunction. That's like compelled speech. I mean, this is like go out and twist this guy's arm, break it off and grind it into a grinder and then send it to his publisher. I mean, it's pretty, pretty draconian. And I guess the way you, if you're a judge, you politically correctly say it's draconian. You just quote it and you sort of say, read it, read it again. You guys well, wrote this stuff. To, to me, uh, we, Jack, you and I expected this result. Yes. So this I, was not surprising. And the basis of it is not surprising. What did surprise me is his affirmative statement that after reviewing the in-camera documents, he finds that Bolton violated security you know, that contains confidential information. That surprised me. That surprised me a bit because I thought the way he would put it was substantial questions exist for- That's what I thought. Trial. He's kind of prejudged this. He's kind of said, look, you want to know my view? Bolton, you put the country at risk. Yes, and I can't- country at risk. I'm having trouble understanding how that's possible. And I'm upset that he made that ruling. And I wonder to what effect that will have binding effect on subsequent hearings in this case. Well, it says in so many words that Lamberth, Justice Judge Lamberth, effectively believes that there is enough information that is now published to give some competitive advantage to a country that may be eventually either in conflict with or at war with the United States or whatever is the stamp standard. But I want to read from the last page because it literally is I'll put it on the screen here. It's an under 10 page. I mean, take the signature block out. It's literally nine and one third pages. And the right. conclusion is what's written there. I'll just put it on the screen because we're dealing in real time and I'll read it. Defendant Bolton has gambled with the national security of the United States. He has exposed, I thought he was gonna say he's exposed our country, but he says he's exposed his country to harm and himself to civil friends and potentially criminal close friends liability period 
but these facts do not control the motion before the court. Nice short sentences, period. The government has failed to establish that an injunction will prevent irreparable harm. Its motion is accordingly denied. Right. Full stop. No statement about, am I going to hold a preliminary injunction hearing? No statement about, am I going to hold an evidentiary hearing? No statement, am I going to accelerate the trial? All the things he could have done. No statement about where the proceeds go. No statement about those proceeds better be locked up. Nothing. Just like the government made this crazy motion. I'm denying it, but I can see that Bolton's done some stuff that he should be ashamed of. Shame on him. I mean, that's the real message I get from this. If you're sitting down in D.C. with John Bolton and you read that last paragraph to him and say, well, what do you think our odds of success are if we get an accelerated trial and we ask for a jury? Well, let me tell you something. I don't think you're going to get a jury. I think it's summary judgment time for the government on the question of breach of contract. Nothing about fiduciary duty. Nothing about tort laws that I can tell. It seems to be a straight up, you did not follow the contractual practice Period. Full stop. I'm looking at page six. Upon reviewing the classified materials as well as the declarations filed on the public docket, the court is persuaded that Defendant Bolton likely jeopardized national security by disclosing classified information in violation of his non-disclosure agreements. Um, you know, is the government likely to succeed on the merits? That's very... I, I don't think the law is that this ruling binds any subsequent judge on the merits. No, there's no subsequent judge here. He's the judge. He is the judge. He is the judge assigned to this case. Now, let me make three points very quickly, and then we'll go around counterclockwise with Bob and then you. Number one, this judge knows that on the docket is a motion to dismiss by Bolton. Bolton filed not only in opposition, but he said this lawsuit is frivolous. Not wow. just the remedy is frivolous, the lawsuit itself is frivolous. That motion is going to be summarily denied given this ruling. Right. He can't, right. he can't possibly act on that motion. Maybe he could say, make some comments about certain remedies are off the table, so I'm going to strike yes. certain portions. But basically, the case stands. Point two, it's very clear this judge is signaling that if he were to give an attachment-like remedy on probable success for breach of contract, not a tort claim, but breach of contract for locking up proceeds, he would grant that remedy. And the government, like friggin' idiots, now maybe you'd say they, they made their bed and they wanted to ride one horse and not two horses, but they had no backup position. The backup position in response to what Professor Acker said should have been, Your Honor, if you don't feel comfortable with the mandatory injunction that we think is necessary, grant us the attachment-like, equitable, constructive trust wrap up that money, make sure it doesn't go to him, make sure it doesn't go to his lawyers. His but lawyers shouldn't be paid either. That money should be locked in a government trust account or the court deposit. That's probably 10 million bucks. That money was probably paid in advance. I haven't seen that yet. And then point three, well, point three, this... let me finish point three. Ideally, he would have said, guys, Whatever you're doing in this case, if you don't sit down and cooperate to do something that is going to resolve it without a lot more fanfare trying to use me and my uh, court as some sort of publicity circus for selling more copies of this book, I am going to come down on both of you like a ton of bricks. Now, I think that's the real meta message in this ruling. I think the real meta message is, John Bolton, you were trying to sell books using an illegal tool to do so, which is an intentional breach of your agreement. And I am going to punish you if it doesn't stop. And I'm going to punish you for having done it. And government, you are frigging asleep at the wheel. You should have filed this case like three months ago or whenever it was pretty obvious that things were starting to unravel. And, you know, we're going to get to that and we're going to get to who threw the first punch and so on. But Jack, you remind me, your Jack, you sound like Tony La Russa, yeah. not Jack Russo, but Tony La Russa criticizing some little league coach. I mean, I've never seen incompetence of this, and that's the saving grace. What if they knew what they were doing, for God's sake? Well, but in any case, going on to remedy, have they, not, have they foreclosed themselves from amending the complaint on Monday and taking your advice? 
No, no, it, it doesn't foreclose. And clearly, if <clears throat> the judge or his clerk is reading any of the tweets that are going on or any of the podcasts that are going on, and there's a million different people commenting in at least a half million different ways, fundamentally, the judge seems to be with the majority, if not super majority view of the academics and the lawyers who actually know how Rule 65 works, of which is actually a very small sliver of lawyers actually understand it. The judge is with them. The clerks are with them. There's a minority view that says the government should be able to do wacky things because the contract is so strict and over the top. I think Raphael and I have talked about this contract being almost arguably unconscionable. The judge doesn't seem to care. He's like, you're a big boy. You signed it. And then the last point about that is somewhere in this, you know, judges as they get older start to get really, really wise to the ways of the world in ways that probably the three of us even collectively are not really super wise. And they've seen every antic of what people do to generate sales of books or movies or whatever it is. And I got to believe they're looking at this like, your friggin' publisher was part of this cabal of thinking. And this law firm, which is a fairly decently regarded law firm, and this lawyer is a fairly decently regarded lawyer, you guys know better than do what you did. You should have come in here for declaratory relief probably three months ago. And so I have to infer that the intention was to use this court, whether me or some other judge on this court, with this nonsense publicity event right out of some sort of storyline of, uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, DC kind of uh, 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 movies that are out there, you know, that talk about how the DC world is so connected with Hollywood and so connected with reality TV. And this is some sort of extension of The Apprentice or some sort of show. And this is an ex-apprentice person that was fired by the Donald, who now is getting back at him and you want me to be helpful to you? Screw that. I got people on death row here that are trying to, I'm trying to figure out whether or not they're going to get the electric chair next Monday. What are you, what are you doing using me for that publicity? Pay for your goddamn publicity. Well, is any of this publicity beneficial to Trump? I if thought I were- at some level, Raphael, I thought at some level, because I was talking to my lovely wife, Dr. Lee Souter. She's got a PhD from Stanford, really smart. She said, this is a complete distraction of what the frick fuck is going, what, what, she doesn't use foul language, what the hell is going on with C-19 and the coming C-20? This is a total distraction. This is changing the news cycle. She yes, said this but- whole thing was engineered probably by Bolton with Trump's agreement. They probably had a call. What are you going to do, John? I'm going to come out with this book. Well, wait a minute. Someone tells me there's a bunch of racy stuff in it. Yeah, there is. But, you know, it's good for us. It'll generate sales. We'll get on the talk shows. You'll do really well. And it's going to distract the nation from what's currently going on that's destroying 100,000 people's families and their lives. A lot of fathers are not going to celebrate Father's Day uh, tomorrow. So let's just do it. Okay, do whatever you want, but I'm going to contest it. Goodbye. With all due respect to Lee. Crazy? Okay, the COVID story hasn't broken yet. It'll break in two weeks when we get the big spike in and around Tulsa, and then the fool has to decide whether to have another round. Yeah. Probably or not. And neither answer is good. It's a completely unforced error. That, I, mean, I mean, that's what's happening. This stuff is just preliminary. Yes. And first of all, back to a, a simple thing. The, requ- the motion on calendar Friday did not include a request to attach funds or impound them. It right. was only for the injunction, correct? Yes. Yes. So that was a mistake. Why didn't they include a request to attach the funds? You could argue that they decide to ride a single horse because anytime you put a second horse into the race, you're signaling to the judge some sort of wimpy, I know what I'm asking for is crazy and nutty, but I've, I got to do that because my Maybe. boss made me do that. And I'm going to basically just suggest that there be some backup remedy. That's really what we're talking about here. Well, maybe. But the other thing is... Impossible is impossible. I, I mean, the, the idea that they're strategizing, not putting in the second horse, because it'll distract from the fact that their first remedy is weak in and of itself. There's That's no right. saving it. Well, but they wanted to ride a single horse to make the judge believe, except it doesn't answer the question you properly gave, Bob, and you affirm, Raphael, which is if you're at a hearing 
that you know the judge is going to look you in the eye and say, so what the heck does the government want? And you answer in a goofy way like, well, let's let John Bolton and his lawyers figure it out. That is like a first-year law student in a mock, mock, in a mock trial, in a mock courtroom, in a mock oral argument would be given a C minus, a C minus. You can't answer that way. It's a wrong answer. It yes, of course. Power. You can't go into court and say, let the defendant come up with a remedy. That's, that's grotesque. It's grotesque. It's like, it's like law school 101. It's like, yeah. I don't care what your LSAT score is. Your answer was too friggin' goofy. I can't let you be a lawyer. You can't answer that way. Well, well, I don't know what the remedy is. I know we've got a lot of stuff in our complaint, but I really can't answer it right now. Well, That's what John Bolton thinks. And I, his I, I don't find this phase of their action interesting because I didn't think an injunction could issue, should issue, or would issue. And that's over now. Okay. Uh, if they get an attachment on the money, it creates an interesting conflict of interest because it then becomes in their interest to sell more books. Well, their interest meaning the interest of the government? Right. So you're saying if the government wants some sort of um, abstract, delightful outcome here, right? delightful outcome will be, listen, we got all the money locked up. The government, the DOJ could use a new, you know, a remodeled set of bathrooms in D.C. or no, something. No, a border wall. Yeah, whatever. I mean, but I think DOJ would be saying, let's get that into DOJ because Bill Barr's got all sorts of improvement ideas for his offices and the the nice bathroom, maybe a bidet and a few other right. things that you get installed, that sort of thing. But conceptually, your point, I thought you were going to go in a multi-level conflict, which is the money is locked up. The government's trying to cause essentially the equivalent of a RICO-style forfeiture, a forfeiture, right. a civil forfeiture. Right. The next level to it is the lawyers are not getting paid. The lawyers for Bolton are like, wait a minute, where's our money? We just are the lawyers in this. But, of course, the judge can say, no, you knew better. You are not above reproach. You don't have clean hands. You have unclean hands. If you want to serve pro bono, go serve pro bono. That's up to you. But I'm not giving you any of that money. That money is completely being forfeited. And then the question is, why does it go to the government? Why shouldn't it be forfeited like to the federal courts? Because they're really leveraging the federal courts at this point. My argument is if it's going to not go to the federal courts, let it go to charity. I mean, it well, should not go. It should not go to either the government or the lawyers or to Bolton or to some even charity that yeah, Bolton or the lawyers suggest. It should go to some charity the judge decides on. Well, the document says the government, doesn't it? The agreements he signed. So what? That's well, I say so what? I don't like these agreements. I think they should be canceled for being vague and, and, and. Okay, so there, there's the creative idea, Raphael. Here's the creative idea. The government should say this money is gonna go to some sort of educational nonprofit that seeks to improve the way in which SCI, super sensitive confidential information under these various wacky agreements that no one, even probably Corbin, and Williston are spinning in their graves trying to understand the contract language. You know, famous, famous authors of famous, famous treatises on contract law, still in publication, they're spinning in their graves because they can't understand how this kind of contract could even be written. It's so over the top. And the point is to have some real think tank without spending a lot of time, literally very quickly say, Here's five improvements that might have prevented this nonsense no. from ever occurring. The government does not want any clarity around confidentiality and classification of documents. Well, that's, that's a, I mean, that is improper in the United States. It might be proper in Russia. It but might be proper in China. But, but that's the proper truth. proper in the United States to have that kind of goal. Let's have intentional ambiguity so that you're screwed as an ex-government worker from coming even close to the line. But that, that's what Snowden revealed, Snowden the whistleblower. Right, but Snowden didn't do the same thing, which is if you're going to be a whistleblower, you got to sort of up front go into court. If the government doesn't want to help you, you got to go into court, file a whistleblower suit under right. seal, and then hope that a judge like Royce Lambert says, 
hey, this is a worthy subject for some judicial review. That's a different issue because the process is complicated by whether it's the district court or it's the FISA court or it's some other court. And there's been a lot of criticism about that. But I want to stay with the more generic question and get Bob's input. What about this idea of putting the money into some sort of think tank? Berkeley has a lot of think tanks. You were working at Berkeley. You know how the operation goes there. They have a business school. They have a law school. They've got kind of a school of public policy. Would Berkeley take up the mantle there? I know you don't speak for them, but I'm Obviously, you give some money to a university, they'll put together whatever think tank they can put together. There's a lot of people that have time on their hands working from home, right, Bob? Well, my feeling is they would take money under any circumstances, whatever, okay? Right. It's certainly including these. Right. I mean, here you go. His advance was $10 million and there's another guarantee of another 10 That's $20 million. How do you feel about, like, putting a law professor, a business school professor – and maybe a literature professor who actually knows how to, he or she knows how to write quality English, the quality English language, not just a law professor, not just a business school professor, but someone right in the middle that says, if we're going to express this, let's make it short sentences, plain words. Let's follow the teachings of people who know how to really write contracts in plain English. And let's do that. Well, I have another question. This reminds me of the subject you and I got into a couple of weeks ago about Ellison in, in Minnesota, if you remember. And I'd like to do that subject sometime. Yes, absolutely. But maybe this is a bit of a, a byroad at this point. Yes, Rafi, I'll ask your last question. I wanted to go back to the agreement signed, but suppose suppose that that Bolton had taken a speaking tour engagement and his notoriety is entirely attributable to his role, former role. Yes. But he has a speaking tour and doesn't say anything confidential. Can he keep the money according to their agreements? Yes. Without clearance? Yes. But so long as he's only talking at an extremely high generic way, like there's a coming conflict, there's a coming battle, uh, we have lots of issues, you know, that generic sort of... Well... You know, what you see, what you see on the TV most most days on Fox News and CNN, it's high level generic bullshit. Yes, so but detail to it. But it's without advance clearance. In other words, it's a form of publication, not run through the clearance office with no SCI involved, no sensitive confidential information, well, and no well, CI involved. But what if somebody in the government comes, pops up, and says, "Hey, wait, that was SCI." Then he's got a problem. Then he's got to no. say, I mean, your point is there's, a, there's unfettered discretion for someone to say that fart had the smell of SCI. In it. And he's like, that's a, just a normal fart. It has a normal smell to it. No, 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 no. You actually farted something out of your mouth that signaled to the Chinese leaders that Donald Trump is weak. And you know his weakness because you know something about him that you got as a result of access given to you to him and that office in that room, even the location of that room is confidential and you reveal that. He's got a problem, but that's why he has clearance lawyers who will edit that speech and supposedly keep him clear of the line. Now, I think those clearance lawyers were told, you know, come on, you got to put some stuff in here to make this book sell. And we got to have a way to say some things, because if you look at the stuff that actually is in the hands of the public and will be in all three of our hands, because I bought books for you guys as well as a gift for you guys coming on. You should get that next week. It's only a dozen passages that we're going to all laugh about. We're going to laugh. We're going to say there's nothing to this. This is bullshit. How, how the heck did this become confidential information? Yes. That's going to happen here. Inevitably, we're going to say that fart smells... Like a normal fart. I, I don't know how these trials proceed because I've never I've had some confidential documents in my business litigation, but government confidences I haven't dealt with. But I don't know how this trial goes forward. Well, I, Bolton... I have dealt with it, and I can tell you what happens is that the documents are heavily redacted, the trial is sealed, the jury is told specifically, even though jurors don't sign confidentiality agreements. The jury is verbally instructed, no tweeting, no texting, no note-taking, no photographs, 
no camera, no dictation. Of course, the jurors are doing whatever they want in their own time. That's the reality. We all know that. But the judge is very sternly giving admonitions often twice a day, the beginning of the session, the end of the session, and sometimes on lunch break, on the way back, on the way out, on the way back. You get tired to hear the same admonition over and over again. The jurors do too. And we know that jurors don't necessarily respect those admonitions. We know that. And we also know that a lot of the press are hounds that follow jurors right out of a courtroom and so, literally go up to them and say, how would you like to make some money? I mean, we know how this stuff works. But, but So your point is valid that there's a normal notion of leakage the minute that anyone files a lawsuit. That's just inevitable or yeah. anytime you're in the public courthouse. Also, how can there be a fair trial on the question of whether there was any confidential information if everything is kept secret? Is it kept secret from the defense lawyer? No, is it no, kept no. Secret the, defense from the, lawyer, the defense lawyer and the defendant typically have a totally unrestricted right. The only way there's an exception to that is if the judge is convinced that the particular matter is so sensitive that it has to be filtered through an expert witness on each side, like some super algorithm like C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine cosine of, of C, I think, was the original formula. If you say, I discovered that formula and it's going to change the world because it's an advantage over the Pythagorean theorem, maybe that formula would theoretically at some level constitute, hey, it's got to be run through experts who are going to recognize that new formula is going to change the world. But that is so rare. That's like one in every million cases, if, if ever. But I agree with you. I agree with you that fairness requires that cross-examination be robust. We've talked about this, Bob, and I have talked about this even on air. How is it that you can have a robust cross-examination if A, the information is restricted, and B, most lawyers don't even know how to cross-examine very well to begin with, as we know by talking to people like Irving Younger, who talks about how bad most lawyers do cross-examination. Well, if you tie their hands behind their backs and you don't give them the fodder to actually impeach the witness, how the hell are you going to have an adversarial process that actually gets to the truth? Yeah. The whole basis of it is that you're going to be able to cross-examine and impeach and let the, let the facts and the cards turn right side up in the course of a jury and a judge evaluation and an appellate review to boot. I, 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 I would like to f figure out a way to undo the government's ability to classify documents, <laughs> frankly. All together. Except possibly in wartime. All possibly. together. All together. All right? together. I'd like to see it totally banned. But, but that is going to be viewed as suspect when you have people who do have state secrets. Because, look, I agree with you that it, I don't think they said to Bolton on the way in, nor do they say to a lot of other folks, look, you're signing in. You might be terminated in three months, six months, nine months, maybe 18 months, as it happened with him. But you're going to be restricted for life. Right. L-I-F-E. Right. That's what they told them. information for life, not one year, not two years, not five I, years, yeah. like the equivalent of a non-compete in certain areas where you could profit from some combination no. of your expertise and experience and as lit with the gasoline that the government brings into the picture. You, you will be prohibited for life. Yes. But we can't tell you now, and we won't tell you now, exactly what you're going to be prohibited from. Yes. We get to decide when we feel like it. Yes. That's a no-go for me. Well, your point is that there's too much discretion, and that's why I said there needs to be some real expert intensive review of if you're going to have some version of what currently is in force, it needs to be reformed, remodeled, recast, you know, you might say restated if you want to be kind, you might say completely abolished and let's start over again yeah. and figure out what really should happen on the exceptional basis. Look, look, I'll give you an example that's completely orthogonal, Raphael. Years ago, we used to take the view under Rule 53 of the federal rules that special masters were the exception and not the rule in civil litigation. Yeah. The exception, the extremely rare exception. Rule 53 says special masters are private citizens. They're not judicial officers. They become 
deputized for the purpose of a case. In today's litigation, extremely high stakes IP litigation, almost without exception, a special master is appoint appointed to manage discovery. You've been a special master, I've been a special master, lots of people that have over 30, 40 years of experience have been special masters. And we know we get these assignments, they're complicated, but it's not exceptional anymore. It's become common. So you could argue stuff needs to change. Now that rule probably is applicable to normal, simple cases, but in the complex cases, it's almost become 180 degrees the other way. So we see as life changes and becomes more complicated, things start to get complicated. And yeah, in the old version of the world where secrets couldn't walk out with the USB drive and people couldn't take the equivalent of your 1600 page beautiful fiduciary duty uh, treatise on one little tiny four gigabyte USB drive that you can buy at a 7-Eleven for six bucks and literally copy everything off of your online version if you if you have the permission or you hack into it. It's a different world. We're in a different world now. And oftentimes you have to make changes. So that's maybe where we are on all this SCI and government restricted information stuff. It's got to be completely revamped. That's where I am on it. And obviously whether Berkeley or at Stanford or somewhere else, if anyone's listening from those schools, it's an apt time to petition Judge Lambert and try to intervene and talk about where that money goes. Because I have to tell you, I don't think it should go to the government. And I certainly don't think it should go to John Bolton. And I question whether it should go to John, any of it should go to John Bolton's lawyers, because it's pretty obvious to me that they were either willfully blind or reckless in how they decided to go forward with this process, because you do have to get an actual ink-based or electronic ink based sign off. You cannot rely on somebody's verbal. A verbal is not gonna count. As some people like to say, it's not worth the paper that it's not written on, <laughs> right? People talk yeah. about that all the time. So thanks you guys for coming on board. I really appreciate the last minute. We might do a part four, depending on whether they decide to take an appeal here. I have to say, if they take an appeal here, I'm just gonna crack up. But you know, I've been surprised before at what creative lawyers can do, and I'm sure the DC Circuit will act pretty promptly to back up Judge Lambert, because big applause to Judge Lambert, his clerks, his staff, they obviously worked right into the midnight hours, probably into two, three this morning to get that thing on Pacer, and I got an alert from Pacer instantly, and I got up at like 5 a.m. this morning, like looking forward to it, so it does bring some excitement back in your life when you see things like this, right, Raphael? And yes, Bob, it does. I mean, just to look at that stuff and sort of sure. be able to say the system actually works and justice can be that quick. I mean, think about it. We're talking like 72 hours to more or less final disposition, more or less a decision on the merits. I don't know how many hours the judge spent, but it couldn't have been like, you know, 60 hours. Just wouldn't have been enough time in the day. Mm -hmm. um, maybe he has, and maybe he's- I didn't find the that, situation that complex, frankly. It's very simple, right? It wasn't complex. This right. part of it is not complex. Yes. Going right. forward, there may be some complexity. We'll pick I, it up. I, we'll pick it up, guys. Uh, hopefully later this month. Have a good. Jack, I just sent you an email saying we, if we do this again, okay. we, it has to be in person because I can't do it from here. No, we'll so let's that. do that. We'll figure that out before you leave. Before you leave for Laos. Thank you, guys. Thanks Bob, for good coming on board. You. See you all later. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.